Production funding for this program is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. I'm Eric Barnes, publisher of the Memphis Daily News and host of Behind the Headlines. Thanks for joining us for a conversation with Dr. Brian Waldron from the University of Memphis. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. You are director of CSER. Tell us what CSER is. Uh, CSER is a research center at the University of Memphis, and we are a center that focuses on three main areas, water being one of them, GIS or mapping is the other, and the third one is looking at the urban environment, the urban community. It, it, I've been in Memphis 20-something years and, and kind of knew about the aquifer, knew that you know, people talk about the great water that, that Memphis has. It comes from an aquifer. I didn't really know what that meant, though, I mean, honestly. And I think that's probably true of a lot of people. Mm -hmm. it, it got to be in the news you know, as, as TVA, as this new power plant is going in and there's drilling into the aquifer, and suddenly it, it hit the news in a new way, which we'll, we'll get to to some extent. But tell us what the aquifer is, what an aquifer is, and, and, and some of the unique characteristics of the Memphis aquifer. Okay. Well, most people, when they think of underground water, they think of an underground lake or a big pool of water. And that is actually not the case. Beneath us in Memphis is actually uh, sand, primarily sand. There is some gravel and there's a very large body of it. And the water actually fills the voids between the sands and gravels. And that's, that constitutes the aquifer. Um, and that covers primarily much of West Tennessee. There are other types of aquifers that you'll have in Middle Tennessee and East Tennessee, which are karst or caves or fractured rock, but primarily or only in West Tennessee do we pull from these sand type aquifers. Yeah, because I think I pictured sort of a big cavern, that if you mm -hmm. went down in there, there's a big underground pool, and as mm -hmm. you said, underground lake, but it's right. more of a, a sponge of sand or a sponge of rock or something in layman's terms. It is, it's like if you go to the Gulf of Mexico and you see the water wash up, the waves wash up yeah. onto the sand and the water seep in, that's what it is. It's just a bunch of sand with water in between. And it reaches, you just said, from you know much of West Tennessee, much larger than I think people realize in terms of the scale of it. It is, it's actually uh, what we call an embayment. It's just a geological term and it crosses eight southern United States. It's huge. Uh, the majority of that coverage is in Tennessee, Arkansas, and Mississippi, but goes as far north as the uh, southern tip of Illinois. And who, who, all the communities around here in one way or another are taking their water from it? I mean, is that Primarily. Uh, there are some communities that will take water from surface water, but most will, and there's multiple aquifers beneath us. It's not just one but most will take water from groundwater. And when you say multiple, you mean what I would think of maybe as layers or depths of it, mm -hmm. is that? Okay. Yeah, like a stack of pancakes. Yeah. So part of what, you know, in, in many ways when, you know, we look at our natural resources, we think of them as unlimited. You know, mm -hmm. if you look at the Mississippi River, it's just flows and flows and flows, or you look at, you know, land, or there's a view of, of these things like aquifers that they are unlimited. Right. And when you describe the scale of it, you know, you can't help thinking, but oh, well, there's nothing to worry about. That 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 is right. a, a resource that'll be there forever. It's been there for however many, you know, you'll millennia. tell me millennia. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but there is there are concerns about it, right? There are concerns about over tapping it and 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 abusing it. Talk about that. There are. Um, you know, we do take it for granted. Uh, you can turn on the faucet and you get great water, and it seems unlimited. Uh, it's it. I think it irritates a lot of people that I've heard that when it's raining outside and you drive down the street and people's sprinkler systems are going, I think we really, as Memphians, take it for granted. But it is a finite source. It, it is not just infinite supply. There is a lot of it. Uh, the figure that we've used is 57 trillion gallons of water beneath Shelby County. And that's a bit hard to visualize, but if you put a wall around Shelby County and took all the water out of the just the Memphis aquifer, our primary one, and put it and flooded that, mm -hmm. it would rise to the top of the Clark Tower. That is a lot of water. And when you think of that, you're like, oh, we got a lot of water, this is great. And we, we do, but quality of that is another issue. And if you contaminate the water, then all this great water we have doesn't really mean much. So we do look at the concern about overuse um, and the management of that, which is an issue, but then also the, quanti the quality of that. Are we 
potentially contaminating that groundwater or what are those types of threats? It, who does manage it? Well, the utilities are uh, probably the best stewards of the groundwater system. They, their customer base are the citizens and therefore they are uh, providing the best quality water to them. So they provide uh, stewardship of that, but they provide our center funding to help do the research necessary okay. to ensure quantity and quality uh, and some level of sustainability. And is there, is there coordination across, I mean, the, the aquifer does not know county boundaries, it doesn't know state boundaries. Correct. Is there coordination across the various governmental entities that, that exist above this sprawling um, resource? Um, there has been some good communication between Shelby County and Fayette County to the east. Fayette County is the recharge zone for us, primarily. What, what does that mean, recharge zone? Where the water, groundwater is replenished. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, but I'll say we really don't know what that recharge rate is, which is an issue. But when you look across the state line, uh, there has been attempts of coordination between, uh, let's say, state agencies and universities, but of recent, the lawsuit between Mississippi and Tennessee to Tennessee uh, has kind of broken that tie, unfortunately. Um, the, the, the quality of the water, again, going back to how I started, you know, people talk about that, and it is if you, you know, it's not an exaggeration. If you go to other cities, you drink the water, and you forget. Right. You, it'll, it'll give you a reality check on how good the water is here, mm -hmm. um, and is largely untreated. Is that correct? I mean, as it comes, what we get in our taps is not somehow altered dramatically correct. from what it is in the, water, the aquifer. That has been at various times a, a kind of a um, economic development resource. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the 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 brewers talk about the beer, the local beer people talk about how they don't have to treat their water very much. You talk Correct. bottlers and so on. Um, and the same time, does that is that concerning? I mean, you have industrial or quasi-industrial commercial uses of this water. I, is that concerning in any way? Not from the utility standpoint, because that's one of those marketable factors about Memphis and Shelby County is that industries can come here and not have to pay exorbitant pretreatment costs for the water that they would use within their manufacturing or whatever they do with it because it does come out at such a high quality. There's not a lot of regulation on drilling into the aquifer. I mean, I mean, is it true that I mean, I could basically go home and drill into the aquifer? I mean, is it that unregulated, unregulated or is that an exaggeration? It's, it is somewhat of an exaggeration. You can go and request a permit to drill for groundwater. There is nothing out there that stipulates um, in any great detail what, what you can and cannot drill, use the water for, uh, per se. So uh, you can go and just request a permit, you drill your well, and you're good to go. Yeah. The history of the aquifer. When did, when did when did people realize it was there? That I mean, they obviously realized you could mm -hmm. drill and get water, but when when did the the full scale of it uh, become known? Uh, it was back in the late 1800s, around 1886. Uh, actually, Memphis went through three. Well, they went through a number of yellow fever epidemics, and their largest one was in 1878. There were 5,000 deaths, about 20,000 people left Memphis, and Memphis lost its charter for, I think, the third time, and almost to a permanent degree. We used to get our water out of the uh, Wolf River, and there was a, a guy that owned an ice company, Bolin Hughes, R.C. Graves owned the Bolin Hughes Ice Company. So he drilled a well and kept going and going and hit clay. He's like, oh, keep going and going. and. Uh, sure enough, hit the Memphis aquifer and it was under so much pressure because it had not been tapped. Water shot up to the surface and poured out onto the streets. And uh, there's a great quote by the state of Tennessee health director in 1890 saying that, you know, physicians were giving pres prescriptions, you know, let the baby drink artesian water. It was just like just a great resource. And that brought back Memphis. If you go to the Pink Palace Museum, you'll see a, a whole history about the yellow fever epidemic. But I don't think Memphians realized what got us out of it, and it was our water. And is that because you talked about oh, until then, <clears throat> the city got, people got their water from <clears throat> the Wolf River, and that was polluted or not? I mean, was that that's where the yellow fever was? Go back to that connection. It was not a sufficient quantity. Okay. Um, it was not enough quantity to 
uh, flush the sanitary sewer system. And uh, it did, you know, the, the surface water systems did bring, breed mosquitoes and such to kind of fed that, that epidemic. Um, it was not until that we found the abundant source, the Memphis sand, that we were able to have clean drinking water, that uh, the hygienics of that and the waste treatment, it was able to, to handle all the needs of the city and that's what brought us back. And that first well you talked about, where, where, was that in what we now think of as downtown? Where, where was that? It is in downtown. Uh, the streets don't exist anymore. Um, yeah. And uh, I actually found the well house on an old uh, Sanborn fire map. You know, Sanborn maps are fire maps. And uh, I found it sitting yeah. there. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, how many wells are there now in give or take? In, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, give or take about 180, 200 wells. How far down do, do you have to drill? I, you may have said this and I apologize, but how far down when they're drilling or back in the 1800s were they drilling to hit that? Water. They used to call the Memphis sand the 500 foot sand because that's the typical depth that you would drill to. You can go about downtown, you can go about 350 feet and then you'll get to the top of the Memphis sand. But they'll go further in because it's not just all one kind of sand. You have coarse sand, medium sand, fine sand, and the water will move faster through certain sections of the of the aquifer, but around 500 feet. How did you get into this work? I mean, what's your background that led you to this place and this interest in, in, in these issues? I needed a job <laughs> as a student. <laughs> at least you're honest. <laughs> uh, I was at the University of Memphis in my undergrad and started working at the Groundwater Institute as a digitizer. So I would digitize city plans, but they would do groundwater. So I kind of got into that. And uh, when I did my master's, I had worked at the Inst Groundwater Institute, so I did my master's at the university. Loved groundwater and went to, just stayed with it as I went to Colorado State and uh, came back to teach. So I got into it from that world. Well, and other aquifers, I mean, you talked about the middle Tennessee one. Let's go back, that, that is more, did you say more of a cavernous one? The, it is, yeah. caves. Mm -hmm. And what, what are the, I mean, what risks are there for middle Tennessee, what, or, or not? Are there advantages to different types of, of aquifers? Well. The, the aquifers in Middle Tennessee are, are uh, impacted more quickly by contamination because it's just a solution channel. It's like a pipe in rock, and, and the water will push through, and you can get contaminated very quickly within hours. Um, when the drought hit Tennessee, I guess it was like maybe 10 years ago, the uh, water was being shipped in trucks to cities because they were running out of water. Here our water dropped maybe a foot yeah. uh, over 800 foot thick aquifer system. So we just didn't feel it. But out in middle and east Tennessee, you feel the seasonality of availability of water and you have a greater chance expediency for contamination. Well, I remember, I don't know how many years ago it was, but when Atlanta went through the drought that, that the, the, the lake reservoir north of Atlanta and I, mm -hmm. it had gotten to a level that was um, low and mm -hmm. dangerous. Because once you get in a reservoir, and that's an open kind of lake or whatever, it, that it gets dangerous at some level. It's not, or it's not dangerous, but it's not as clean as, as you would want it to be. So in general, I mean, in terms of cities, in terms of droughts and climate change. I mean, where do you, when you look forward, I assume that's part of what Caesar does is mm -hmm. looking forward and trying to do some projections. How do you incorporate climate change into planning and predicting the use and levels of, of the aquifer? Well, you know, you can take the idea of, of management of the aquifer into three very small pieces. Uh, you have a box and that's your aquifer. And we know what's in the box, the 50, 57 trillion gallons of water. And we know what's being taken out of the box. We have 180, 200 wells, so we know what's being pumped out. So the third piece to manage the whole system is what's going into the box, and that's the recharge. That's the precipitation from Fayette County and elsewhere. So that's the part we don't know very well. And what Caesar has been trying to do for the last 15 years is to measure recharge because you need to know all three pieces to do management. 
and that's been very difficult. Recharge really, again, is, in layman's terms, is just the rain that flows and, and essentially soaks through? I it mean, does. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you, you're talking about it soaking through in Fayette County. It does, this is, you know, forgive me, non-scientist question here. Rain in Shelby County doesn't refill, recharge the aquifer, or just not at the same effectiveness as Fayette County? I would go with the same effectiveness. The, the thing that we have here in Shelby County is we have a shallow groundwater system. Okay. It's sand and gravel. Then there's a big thick clay with some holes in it, and then the, then the Memphis sand. So the rain hits the top aquifer. It doesn't hit the Memphis sand directly. When you go to Fayette County, the Memphis sand has come up to the top and it's at the surface. So when the rain hits in Fayette County, it's actually raining on top of the sands. It's almost like, a, I mean, the, again, my sort of strange analogy, but it's almost like a, a leaky roof where the, you know, the water mm -hmm. comes into your kitchen. You think it came through the roof right above the kitchen. It, particularly if you have an old house, it may have come from the other side of the house and run right. through the walls and come through. And that's what's going on throughout. So that water that hits in Shelby County maybe recharges a whole other part of the aquifer and potentially, or, no, or does it just hit the, the Mississippi or? It hits rivers yeah, and that yeah. goes to the Mississippi River, or it may, infiltrate into the shallow upper aquifer, which we don't use. Um, but primarily, you know, Fayette County, further on, is our recharge area, and that's the rain that falls and flows underneath uh, us. It just takes thousands of years to do it. Yeah. Uh, connect that to, you talked about the Wolf River, and you, you were a board member of the Wolf mm -hmm. River Conservancy, is that right? Yes. For quite some time. Um, where, when you talk about Fayette County and people who've been to the Ghost River and that incredibly beautiful oh, yes. area, that's part of what you're talking about. Yes. That area is recharging the aquifer. Yes. Um, it, and the area away from it. Okay. Yeah, the watershed itself. The watershed itself. It, it's a little bit of a digression, though, but since we've talked about the wolf so much, it, it, is it edifying for you to see the Wolf River Greenway coming in and to see more? I mean, I you know, the first times when I first moved to Memphis 20-something years ago, I didn't really know what the Wolf River was. It was that river by the highway that was kind of channelized and not. But then over mm -hmm. time, there's more and more exposure to Ghost River um, area to getting out on the Wolf River. Right. Um, is that helpful? Is that nice to see? I mean, of course it is. I think that, you know, having citizens connect back to the environment is very important. It, it creates a, a sense of ownership or investment in, in self and, and what they want to, you know, protection of the environment that they can do individu as individuals. So I think that's very important. And I think for the city of Memphis being such an urban city, that it is a great opportunity for people to get have a place nearby to get out into nature without having to travel you know, across state or elsewhere. We talk a little bit about the environment and environmental issues over the past few years of issues with water in, um, let's say Detroit, or, or not Detroit, sorry, in Flint. Mm -hmm. um, your thoughts on that, did you watch that with your own eye and, and the disaster that was in, in the disruption of the water supply and um, your thoughts on that? I did, I did watch that. Um, I reflected back on what we have here and we're very blessed to have uh, a groundwater system that, uh, is of a very high quality and has a layer of protection above it, the clay, except for a few holes in it. And that, that what we saw there in Flint, Michigan is not something in the way that they saw it that we're gonna see here. You know, we may begin to see changes in water quality due to, uh, you know, contamination coming through these holes in the clay but, uh, and which is a concern, but I don't think we're gonna see the enormity of the Flint, Michigan system here. That was, they had redirected, uh, my layman's terms here, they'd redirected the water source and that changed the pipes and the lead that was in there, but that was basically protected, was let loose in the, in the changeover of water mm. sources. Is that right? That, that... I, I am actually not sure okay. to that level. Yeah, um, with the, um, you talk about the holes in the clay. Mm -hmm. um, those holes, again, if you said it, I apologize. Wh where do those come from? Is that just a naturally occurring process where the clay gives way, or is that man-made damage as we've drilled into it? It is uh, prior. It, they are natural. Uh, the clay was laid down when the uh, ocean waters flooded this area, so the clay was in very still water and very slowly settled out. When the oceans receded, 
the upper aquifer layer, which is sand and gravel, was deposited by rivers. So those rivers kind of ate through the clay and created these old, what we call paleo channels, or historic old channels, and ate through the clay and created these holes. And uh, that is how we get water that's primarily from the shallow aquifer, the one up above, that is contaminated in various locations, going down in through these breaches in the clay and into our drinking water supply. And when you say contaminated, that's contaminated with what? It's a variety of things. It could just be water of poor quality versus water, uh, you know, bringing in landfill leachate versus water picking up industrial contaminants and washing them into the, or flowing those into the groundwater system. How much does it, I don't know how to ask this question, but how much does it take to pollute the, the, how much contaminant would it take to pollute the aquifer in a way that drinking water would really be at risk in Memphis? I mean, is, is, is it a 50 gallon barrel of no, some sort of industrial thing no. or is it a train car sized or, I mean, what, give some scale to that. It's hard because it depends on the contaminant and such like that. Sure, right. um, it's not a 55 gallon drum, uh, but it is typically those types of sites that have been dumping for years and over that period of time that contaminant has moved into the groundwater system and finally found its way to a well and that takes a, a lot of money to clean up because it's gone over such a long distance. And how would you even, I mean if something got far enough into the aquifer, how do you clean that up? I mean how do you get down, I mean it's not like you can go down, you know, 500 feet and, and soak it all back up. Right. There's a lot of methodologies to remediate, fix the groundwater. Um, they all vary based upon the type of contaminant. Some can just be treated by blowing air into it. Others, you can insert bacteria that feed on that type of contaminant. Uh, so it kind of, it does vary based upon the type of contaminant. But what you do have to do is that because it's not a cave, you can't just go down there and look at it, it's all sand, you have to drill into the aquifer and in place these uh, remediation, uh, I don't know, systems mm -hmm. in order to kind of clean it. Are you comfortable that there are the processes and the methodologies and the, the everything in place to, to fix that kind of thing? If something, uh, the worst case scenario did happen? Engineering wise, yes. You know, uh, I am not comfortable with the our ability to fully understand the implication of contamination to our groundwater system. We, we know that the water beneath us should be about two or 3,000 years old, but we are pulling out some water that is young as 13 years old. And we attempt to age date the groundwater. We attempt to understand the context of impact by pollution, but it is so piecemeal and it is so poorly funded that there is, um, that in order to do it on a countywide scale, it's just, it's, it's very hard to answer those types of questions. How, how, one small question, how do, you judge, how do you measure the age of water? That, that's fascinating to me. Uh, different ways, the way that we do it, uh, we use uh, tritium. It's okay. a uh, natural, <clears throat> occurring radioactive isotope in the ground, typically at, I think, 0.5 TU, it's either 0.5 or 0 0.05. But anyways, in the 1950s, when we had above ground bomb testing, it shot up to 50,000. So big difference, and it decays, and we know how fast it decays. So what we do is we pull out the water, and we send it to Utah, which has a very special lab, and based upon the tritium and its degradated product, uh, helium-3, we can get an age, and that's how we do that. Or sulfur hexafluoride, it's a man-made product, and we send that to the U.S. Geological Survey, and we can get an age with that. And let's go, a bunch of things you said I want to go back to, but one is just that the water we drink, you said, might be two or 3,000 years old. Mm -hmm. So tonight I wash my dishes or I have a glass of water. That water literally is 2,000 or 2,000 years old. Pretty much. That, I didn't know that. Um, the other thing is back to the contaminants and the, and the underfunding and the, the, you know, how much, you know, if you could wave a magic wand, how much more sampling, how much more testing, how much more monitoring would, would be happening? Okay. Well, you know, one, we get uh, great support 
financial support from the utilities. So Memphis Light, Gas and Water is our biggest funder. And uh, then we also have Bartlett, Germantown, Carterville, and Millington. And they each give us money that we use for education and going out and trying to do some of this research. They all realize that we're limited even in that with what we're able to do. So we know that to do age dating for the whole county, it's probably going to be about $80,000, $85,000 a year. Um, which is not much when you think about protecting your groundwater system. And when you look at uh, the entire aquifer system, uh, we're, we were kind of discussing this earlier when the TVA incident kind of came up with some of the senators and others who kept asking the question. It was around three quarters of a million to a million dollars a year to kind of look at it in a more broader sense. And to do it every year. Mm -hmm. and, um, For at least five years. I mean, we kind of put that out there, but yeah. Okay. Well, we'll leave it there. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thanks sure. for being here. You're and welcome. Thank you for joining us for a conversation with Dr. Brian Waldron. Thank you.